Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am Todd Rennebaum. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for checking out this episode. And, uh, you know, if if you like what you hear, if you're a regular listener, thank you so much. And and you know what? I am recording this on April 8th. On April 10th, it's my one-year anniversary. April 10th of last year very first episodes of bunny hugs and mental health came out so hey happy birthday podcast and and you know what i i don't ask for much you know for my one year birthday all i really ask for is is for you to just take a moment rate and review the podcast and that's it maybe tell a friend that'd be awesome too and you know i i put my you know i put my heart and soul into this thing I do, and I, I love it, and I love that you listen. So, uh, yeah, one year, boom. Anyway, I am going to be doing weekly episodes again, not every other week, so that's exciting. And uh, I am working with uh, my brother, who is a video editor and stuff, and uh, we're going to be doing YouTube videos of, of each episode real soon, hopefully sooner than later, you know. Both of us have day jobs. I'm starting a day job right away too. So it's going to be hectic. I've been, I've been interviewing like a madman here. I've got so many cool guests coming up. So, um, I, I, I am actually really, really excited about, about the different people coming up. Uh, speaking of which next week, the episode features a really great lady. Her name is Robbie seal and she's a podcaster. And she has 20 years life experience with FASD, that's Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. And she has her own podcast called FASD Family Life. She actually has, I think it's three kids uh, that she's adopted with FASD. And so, uh, yeah, she's got her hands full. And she's an expert um, with with all the life experience she's had with that. So uh, it's, it's super interesting. I learned a ton, so listen to that episode next week. Now, before I talk about this week's guest, I just want to give a quick shout out to Jeanette, who I met at the Saskatchewan legislature the other day. And I forgot to say hi to her last week. So hi, Jeanette. I hope you're listening still. And you didn't get mad that I didn't say hi. And I want to say a big hi and thank you to my friend, Heather Bellog. She's just a super lady who's a huge support for me in the podcast and just just for me in general. So thank you for that. Now, in this episode, we're going to play a little game. I give a quick little fact, and it's actually completely wrong. So at the end of the episode, I will I will reveal the answer in, in what fact I gave that's actually wrong. So won't that be fun? So anyway, my guest today is... Alyssa Kaufman. She's a psychologist in Miami, Florida. Now she specializes in OCD and addiction. And I've been wanting to do this episode for a long time. Uh, it's, it's all about OCD. So I, you know, I thought I knew stuff about OCD and I mean, I knew some, but I, I learned a ton speaking with Alyssa. So, uh, not only do I learn a lot about OCD, but I learned a lot about this new treatment modality that she has created called rip r therapy so stay tuned for that which is coming up right now so without further ado i give you Alyssa kaufman so we work with i i designed my own treatment and it it could be used for obsessive compulsive disorder uh, it could be used for somebody struggling with addictions, um, binge eating disorder, and basically, basically anything that would be considered a compulsive behavioral problem, skin picking, hair pulling, um, klepto- we just have a kleptomania couple that came in. Um, 
uh, gambling, shopping, anything compulsive in nature. Right. Okay. Is that basically what OCD is? Because I've heard of all different types of OCDs. Is that like I, it's more than just like you see in the movies and TV with people flicking the light switches and counting as they coming in and out of the doors or whatever. It's it's more than that, isn't that right? Like there's other types. Yes, there's lots of subtypes of OCD. I think people get confused sometimes. Uh, it used to be even when I went to graduate school, I, I didn't know I had OCD when I was in grad school because I hadn't uh, had my breakdown of OCD, so to speak. Um, and I remember learning about OCD. Literally, it was a picture in a textbook with a man washing his hands. And it said what an obsession was. It was a disturbing, intrusive thought that wouldn't go away. And the compulsion was the behavior it made you do. So, you know, the disturbing thought is my hands are dirty. And then it would push you into wanting to do some sort of compulsive behavior like like hand washing. And, and that was it. That's all I was taught about OCD. <laughs> that was my training. <laughs> but yes, there's so many other types. Um, you know, we could go into subtypes. There, there's a, I don't know how many, but yeah. Like, and, and it's funny because OCD is one of those disorders that actually has their own community. <laughs> no, it sounds funny. Much like addiction has a community, like people with the right. So a lot of the names they have, like, I'll give you a few examples. There's like one that's popular, heterosexual OCD. They call it sexual orientation OCD. These people, a continuous doubt whether or not they really are. So if you have someone who's heterosexual, but they're always doubting that they might be homosexual and they can't get themselves out of that loop and they're constantly checking to see. Um, How do you check? <laughs> well, I mean, well, they, okay, so there's a few. You just have sex and be like, yeah, I enjoyed that. That was good. I like that. They they do. Actually, it's true. A lot of them use pornography. They could check and see, like, if you put on um, a man and a woman um, to check and see if that arouses you. Um, if it doesn't, they get extremely triggered, meaning, oh, what does that mean? It's always, what does that mean? I have to get to the bottom of this mystery. Um, avoiding. I had a woman with the HOCD. She wouldn't, um, every time her roommate came in or went to change or went to go in the shower, she would run out of the room as fast as she could um, because it would trigger her. Avoiding certain songs like Katy Perry, I Kissed a Girl. My HOCD ladies do not like that song. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Huh>. Katie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, she's a big fan of mine. So I'm sure she's listening. Oh, is she? No, yeah, I'm I kidding. like her. I like her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was like, I, if she is listening, I like you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could almost guarantee you she's not listening. But <laughs> anyway, oh, that's neither here nor there. You never know. You never well, know. you never know. You never know. That's right. Um, uh, I, I've often wondered if I had OCD as a kid. Like, is it something you can grow out of? Certain uh, types? Well, interest, interestingly enough, children... Children, yes, you will hear stories. I will have a lot of people come in who never grew out of it, obviously, because they're my clients. But I will have people come in and they'll tell me what happened to them as a child. Um, I used to, as a kid, I used to avoid germs and stuff. It's, it is interesting because I have heard stories from people who've had stuff as children and then it went away. It never like came back. Um, I do believe, this is my belief, that does mean you have some sort of genetic predisposition for it. And it could be triggered depending on the environment you're in. Right. Can I, maybe, well, you quickly diagnose me, maybe. I know that's hard, but <laughs> when I was a kid, I would, uh, if I said a certain word, even in my head, I mm -hmm. would then have these long rituals. It was like, if I said God or Jesus Christ, I was like, oh, that's a sin. And then I would like, quickly as fast as I could do this little ritual prayer thing that I and it would go on for like minutes at a time or I would yeah. like as I was walking home from somewhere I'd be like I 
I live in a small town, so it was like, oh, I don't see anybody in the streets. What if there was like, I just walk through a time warp and I get home and no one's there. And like to the point that I was almost physically ill, I'd walk, you know, <laughs> I'd get home and I'd yeah. like run into the house to make sure my parents were there and I didn't go through some time warp and, you know, it was like just weird shit like that. And then I remember actually like consciously saying to myself, like, I got to stop this shit. Like I sound like I'm a psycho. Like why, why do I make myself ill with this stuff? And right. Well, those are those are examples right. of, yes, yeah, scary, intrusive thoughts that you had as a child. And then you did behaviors to make them better, like running inside quick to see if your parents are there. Right. To neutralize it so that you got that relief. So you felt physically ill while walking home and then you saw your parents feel better. Right. Um, so the thing is, you would never have been diagnosed with OCD, in my opinion, because unless your functioning becomes impaired, like everyone could have an example of that, right? Even non OCD people, but does it interfere with your relationships with your friends, your family? Does it interfere with your ability to go to school and to focus on the teacher and learn? Um, these are what we look for when we talk about clinical OCD. Right. Actually, I kind of like, I, I would obsess about my younger sister if she was safe or, you know, like I'd watch, like unsolved mysteries and I was I'd obsessed that my sister was being kidnapped and raped or whatever and uh, yeah. to the point that I, I actually got myself a, a stomach ulcer in like grade 5 grade 6 and um, it was uh, you know my mom called it nerves you just have you know you're just a nervous boy <laughs> but it was, you know so I kind of grew out of the compulsive stuff but I I still have anxiety issues so I don't know if so now it's just anxiety maybe I don't know, Todd. Do you want to join the Rip Our program? <laughs> do you want? To, we can bring you in. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll, give well you, maybe I was reading about I'll it, you, so I'll I was give like... you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe get you a discount, but but yeah, maybe so. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, you could have had it. I had incidents of OCD when I didn't ever knew I had OCD as right. a child. Right. And uh, but I will tell you this: my parents. Nobody would have known there was no OCD. I don't remember a single child going to school with her, their parents. I don't remember ever hearing about anybody with OCD growing up. Same. Um, yeah, I don't remember it. Like, so I could have easily had it. And there was like, I know I had anxiety, but there was really nothing, you know, like mm -hmm. well, I figured it out, you know? So actually, actually I didn't figure it out because I had, my own OCD breakdown at <laughs> my twenties. So, right. Yeah. Maybe. So, no. <laughs> oh, well, actually, sorry. I kind of cut you off when you were talking about the different types of OCD. Yeah. Um, can you maybe uh -huh. just quickly give a few more examples and then we'll, we'll move on to your breakdown and what, what got you, uh, recovering. Okay. Um, more types of OCD. So another popular type would be, uh, this is very popular harm OCD. Uh, what that means is somebody has a, a thought that they could suddenly, a lot of my clients like to use the word snap, right? Like mm. they're just going to like break, suddenly snap and hurt somebody that they love, harm someone that they care about or they love. Um, common compulsions you might get from this are uh, definitely avoidance of any weapon kind of like a sharp object or especially a gun, you know, that makes them very anxious um, that they could snap and get it. Usually they actually avoid a lot of documentaries about, you know, like serial killers and school shooters. Mm -hmm. um, movies like Halloween is a major trigger. The Joker, I mean, half my clients fell apart when that movie came out. <laughs> <laughs> Good movie. <laughs> it was great, actually. <laughs> So, oh, now is Joaquin Phoenix one of your listeners? <laughs> yes, okay. he is. Yeah, him and Katy Perry are my only two. <laughs> yeah, well, Joaquin, I like you also. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's harm OCD. Then we also have um, pedophilia OCD. This is a taboo kind of OCD. A lot of people have trouble talking about this one. It's intrusive thought that they could like harm or sexually molest a child. And common compulsions you'll get with that are, well, first of all, they don't watch Michael Jackson documentaries. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um, that triggers them. Yeah. Um, 
usually avoidance of small children. Uh, I had one client who couldn't even like changed his whole entire route to go to work hmm. uh, because it went past like an elementary school and he didn't even want to drive past it. Uh, how often are people with that OCD are pedophiles? Because it seems to be if you were that worried about it, you wouldn't avoid like you would want to, you know what I mean? Never. The, the answer to your question yeah, okay. is never. Okay. OCD, uh, POCD population is actually the opposite of a pedophile. Like they're so consumed with, they will lock themselves up and ruin their entire life just to make sure, just to make 100% sure that nobody gets harmed by them. The only person an OCD person will harm is themselves and their life. It's a bit like, uh, I, re- I heard a podcast about, um, oh God, not narcissist, but, uh, uh, antisocials. Yeah. Sociopath. A sociopath or what's the other, the psychopaths sociopath. too. And, and, psychopath, and, yeah. and quite often that people wonder, well, maybe I'm a psychopath. And the person said, well, if you're wondering you're, if you're a psychopath, you're not a psychopath. So if you're, uh, you're a hundred percent correct. So there is a type of OCD that also is fear of being crazy, fear of like, schizophrenia, bipolar, fear I have all these things. Hmm. They'll do tons of Google research, usually this crowd. And you're 100% right. They'll come to me and say to me, I was reading about schizophrenia. And do you think maybe I'm in the prodromal stage? And and you're absolutely (laughs) right. Nobody, nobody with schizophrenia has ever asked that question. (laughs) Or nobody with schizophrenia has ever felt physically ill or had panic attacks for the fear that they might have schizophrenia. That doesn't happen. (laughs) It does not happen. Yeah. (laughs) So in a way they're crazy, but for different reasons. Yeah. So (laughs) there was one, there was one, actually, I think when you talk about like schizophrenics, I used to work with that population in my internship year. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not, they're not necessarily tortured. They're, they're kind of, they're in a delusion. They believe what they believe and they're okay. It's OCD people are completely tortured. It's that doubt. It's that part of them knows Mm -hmm. an OCD person is not crazy and it's not ignorant. Um, They know already there's a part of them. They already know they don't have schizophrenia. Right. Yeah. But a seated doubt can torture them and put them in hell and they have to figure it out anyway. Right. So it's, horrific battle within person. So you're breaking up a little bit. And the more compulsions you could do, it's a horrible doubt within the person. Are you still there? Hello? Yeah, do you hear me? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> Hello? Hello, okay. I can hear you now, so let's give it a shot. Okay, give me once, one second. I, my son, he, he goes through trends of really loving certain subjects, and I often worry that he might have some OCD traits. He, right now, he's huge into Bible and religion, and I'm like. I've never taken him to church, but like he's constantly praying and walking around the house and like doing the cross on his body and stuff. And it's like, I've had to ask him a couple of times, like, you know, like if you don't do that, you realize like things might be okay. <laughs> you know, like you don't, don't feel like it's it, right. Right. You know what I mean? That's cool that you like doing that. And if you want to do it, that's great, but don't feel like compelled because something bad might happen if you don't or something like that. And cause oh. it, how old is your son? He's 15. He's 15. Okay. Um, you know what? Remember what I said that like, is he functioning? Oh, you don't have to answer this, but it's like, you know, looking at his functioning, can he, does it, does that kind of behavior ever get in his way of having friends or does it get in the way of his school life? Uh, I don't know. I, I wonder, like I've asked him that too. It's like, you know, you're getting your homework done and you're still hanging out with your friends and stuff. So. I mean, it's hard to tell too, because there's the pandemic was going on. So he wasn't allowed to 
really go out and see people anyway. So, <laughs> but yes, which, which by the way, speaking of the pandemic, <laughs> that has, that has not helped any of my addiction or OCD clients. They've done really, it has been very difficult for a lot of them. Yeah. So I can imagine. Um, I, I'm, I'm in recovery from addiction and I worked in, with, in addictions for a while too. And yeah, it's been, it's like a pandemic of its own. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's been really tough. Um, some kids around your kid's age, I do think they need, they need some time. They, this was very difficult and trying. We have to think of the younger people with the pandemic. And I, I do think they need some time to, to heal because it, it's different when you're, and I have young kids too. I have three young kids. Um, when you're developing, like, you know, your brain, your mind, you're in a developmental kind of stage that, you know, the pandemic, um, you know, cause you're in the environment at those ages, you're still learning around your environment. Mm -hmm. So it's hard because the pandemic with the media and the people and all the, the frantic frenzied, I don't know what you'd call it. Alarming, right. Messages, mm -hmm. all of that. Like they're in a place, it can give all children a sense that the world is very scary. This is dangerous. And then depending also on how the parents are reacting to it. Um, so you know, we're going to be seeing a lot of mental health problems for years because of that, in my opinion. Yeah, I think so. I also think it might be uh, because a lot of people are have had these mental health issues because of the pandemic that maybe wouldn't otherwise have mental health issues. It might be a renaissance too of like self-care and, and, you know, um, bringing mental health to the forefront more because of the pandemic too. Uh, I, I agree. Mental health effects will be catastrophic because, um, because you have a subset of people that always maybe possibly had a genetic predisposition mm -hmm. to pro certain problems, but the environment never triggered them or set it off. And now we created because of the pandemic, an environment was created that could trigger them. Mm -hmm. It's like generational trauma or something <laughs> could create But Yeah. Anyway. Yes. Uh, I'd like to hear your story about how you found out you had OCD and, and uh, your journey with that. Um, so my, so my story started, um, I, I always was anxious if I look back on my life, but not really enough to interrupt with my functioning in life. Um, and so what happened with me was when I was, I would say around my second to third month trimester, may, maybe in my first trimester, but it wasn't a big problem. I started becoming fixated with cats and because they carry toxoplasmosis which could you know i just found out what well, basically when you're pregnant all they want you to do is just not change a litter box it's basically it right um this is with your first I, kid my first yeah okay. so this is he's 12 now gotcha. so we're going back like 13 years okay so i know i look way too young to have a 12 year old it's hard to <laughs> hard to imagine <laughs> uh, same here with a 15 year old <laughs> <laughs> i know i know everybody's shocked i know <laughs> katie perry is completely shocked <laughs> that i <laughs> that i elisa kaufman would have a 12 year old <laughs> her, so yeah. her and yeah. phoenix <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> um so when, so when I started, like, it started slowly, like the thought would come to me, well, okay, and not change a litter box. But um, there was one day I remember I was walking and like, I got, <laughs> this is so gross, but <laughs> I stepped in, I stepped in poop, <laughs> like real poop. It could have been dog poop. I don't know, but it was just disgusting. And it, I handled it and reacted to it in a way that I wouldn't have before. Like it is something about that moment just set me off. Like it created this like panic in me. And I remember that's how it started. It kind of went away. I did a lot of compulsions. I got rid of the sneakers. I showered. I put my feet in the pool, you know, um, I was scared. I called the OBGYN. Um, and I thought it could have been a cat. So slowly I started avoiding 
cats. Like even in the neighborhood, I wouldn't even go to this mall by our house that had like cats outside, like stray cats, you know? And, um, you know, slowly I started to see the effect, like it would annoy my husband that, uh, I, I would like, if there was a cat, I'd be like, nope, not going that way. (laughs) I would go a long way around. (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> um, and then, so that started happening, but everybody was like, oh, okay. You know, she's a little bit neurotic. It's her first child. Right. Mm-hmm. And then it just, it started, you know, I was very, then it started with food in the second trimester. They have a list of foods they don't want you to eat. I would take it to the next level with what I wasn't doing. Um, And then by the third trimester, that's when it started getting really bad. I started becoming obsessed with infection, like HIV specifically, because it occurred to me that could hurt my baby. I might not, if I deliver an HIV baby, um, if I have HIV, I might not be able to breastfeed him. What if I breastfeed him and I have it and I don't know it and then I feed him? And that's how those thoughts started. And then I started avoiding all kinds of anything red, even anything could be blood. And it started getting really bad. Next thing I know, I went to where exactly where you wouldn't want to put me, put me in the hospital to give birth. (laughs) So (laughs) I had, I had like sort of, I can't say it was bad because I walked out with a healthy baby, but it was a horrible experience. Um, I was induced. I was in labor for 25 hours. Epidurals didn't work. I was freaking out the whole time with anxiety. I had to have an emergency C-section. It's like the fast version. It was swine flu time, right? Mm. This is 2009. And I remember I was holding the baby. I was still consumed and totally obsessed with HIV. They actually gave me my labs, which showed negative for HIV. It didn't matter to my OCD because my OCD was convinced that they gave me HIV in the C-section room. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those lab results. So anyone who says just get a test and see it's negative and move on with your life, it doesn't work that way for OCD. Because my OCD was like, these labs are totally invalid because I could have caught it in the operating room. So the labs didn't reassure me. And then what set me off completely was a nurse came in and I was holding the baby and she said, Oh, honey, make sure everyone washes their hands that comes in to visit. Because if that baby gets swine flu, he's toast. Those were her words. Oh, Lord. And that was it. That was it for me. I was done. I went into a cocoon. I barely allowed anyone into my house. I was washing his bottles like six times a day. I... Oh God, what compulsions I do. I was Googling all the time, seeking reassurance from everybody I knew. Um, I could barely, I, I making it to Publix, our grocery store here was really, really difficult. Um, I was in, I felt like hell. It was horrible. And I, the scariest part for me was I'm a pretty tough person. I'm very smart. I've had a challenging life and I've, always been able to kind of get myself out of any situation. What was terrifying was even when I thought in my head, I can't do this. I have to get out of this. I literally couldn't get out of it. I didn't know how I could not stop. It was just terrifying. Every day was terrifying. Hmm. It sounds a little bit like, like paranoid psychosis in a way. Except paranoid psychosis, there's like no, it's kind of random and there's no reasoning behind it. Whereas this, there's a bit of reasoning behind it, but it's just. Well, what happens is, what happens is a lot of OCD people get incorrectly diagnosed with um, stuff like that, like, like psychosis, uh, you know, schizophrenia, delusional disorder, that kind of stuff. Um, I can't stress enough. If you really think about it, it's a 180 degree different. It's the most, it's interesting because it's out of every disorder in the DSM, it's the most different to psychosis because in those disorders, delusional, what delusional means is, and psychosis too, you believe, you believe it. So if you would have come to me in those days and you would have said, do you really think you and your son are going to get swine flu and die? I would have said, 
it would have never been a hundred percent deep down. I was always in there. I always knew that it wasn't, but I still didn't want to take the chance. So it's not delusional because I always knew reality. I always understood reality. And, you know, and then I remember one time someone gave me a actual printout of how you actually catch AIDS, right? It, it didn't matter. I already knew that. I've already lived in the world mm -hmm. and in the environment. I already knew it. I can't, the only thing I could say is it doesn't matter to a person with OCD because you are so addicted to the compulsions. And at that point, you are completely obsessed. It, it's more of an obsession. I was obsessed with HIV. Like I knew, I know, I know now I'm not obsessed with HIV, but I mean, back in those days, I, I knew as much as an infection control doctor. <laughs> like, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I read like everything. <laughs> well, I can kind of relate, I guess, with addiction because it's like I knew I was drinking and using weed way too well. Like I knew I had a problem, but I was just yeah. compelled to keep going with it. Like, like I wanted to stop. I did not like feeling like I needed to drink and use, but I just kept, it's kept very it. yeah, it's very similar. That's why we treat addiction in my program because. It, because it becomes, it's not just the thought, like it's not, that's another differentiation. Like psychosis is a lot of like the thought, like I think I'm Martin Luther King, right? I mean, there's, there's no real torture there. It's more torturous for the friends and family because I, I'm okay. I know I'm Martin Luther King. Yeah, right, you know what right, I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, this is your problem, like, not mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like I'm not doing compulsions about it. I already know I am him, you know? Um, in, in OCD, it's you said it best when you said, I would think something I'd get almost physically ill. It's a feeling of dreadful, horrible, disgusting panic and anxiety comes over the person. I, I couldn't even put it into words what it feels like. That feeling is really more what compels someone to do these compulsions, uh, to, to do anything to get rid of that horrible feeling. And that's what's similar. You could probably relate in addiction is the feeling when you don't have that substance in your body that you have to deal with that horrible physical feeling. The thoughts, okay, they're obnoxious and annoying, but that horrible feeling that comes over you. Now, the delusional psychotic people, they don't really, they're, they're good. They don't have that. <laughs> right, yeah. They're <laughs> not even in touch with reality, really. Right, right. So, yeah, so OCD has nothing to do with psychosis and all of that. It has nothing to do with actually being a pedophile or actually being a serial killer. It's more like they have that thought that there could be a chance and then that horrible panic feeling comes over them and they don't want to handle that feeling. Right, that what if. So, Correct, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of different types of therapies uh, that... Uh, around OCD, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure and response, prev, uh, prevention, acceptance and commitment therapy. And you've tried a bunch of those and you actually came up with your whole, a whole new system of your own. Correct. Um, okay. So let's start with cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. Yeah, so well, let's start here. Mm -hmm. What a person with OCD does not want and what is not helpful is analytic like kind of talk therapy mm -hmm. um why because wouldn't it be great my ocd people including myself would have loved to like if you're my therapist and i have hocd right i want to analyze every aspect of this with you i'm trying to figure out i'm trying to get 100 percent certainty you know uh so for me I used to go, I started in talk therapy. I used to go to him, Dr. Friedman. If you're listening, he might be a listener too. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, Dr. Friedman, I say hi. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. popular you think this podcast is, but, <laughs> but I'm flattered. <laughs> They're all... They're all Katy Perry, Joaquin Phoenix, Dr. Friedman are all in a room listening to this. Oh uh, yeah, Dr. Phil even. <laughs> He, he, Dr. Phil. Yeah, I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny. Um, 
Yeah, but he, no, he was a really, really nice guy, like really great guy. But I used to love going there because uh, it, I would, I would actually go in there with a list. I would hold on to a list of ways I thought I caught HIV during the week. Right. Mm-hmm. And I would go see him. And so all my friends and family thought, oh, good. She's in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He'll fix it. And I'd go in. <laughs> to twist my arm i loved i was like in love with dr friedman there you go i said it i love (laughs) um yeah i would go in with my baby and i would come up with all the ways that i thought i caught hiv and he would he would debunk all of them for me he'd be like i remember he'd be like nope not a chance no you're good nope not a chance (laughs) and we totally have a beautiful compulsive relationship he and i like and then I would get that feeling. That's where it's like addiction. I would get a feeling like someone just gave me heroin. You know, it would feel so good. I would calm down. I would relax, take a big, deep breath. And then I'd get, by the time I was in the parking lot, my OCD already told me why Dr. Friedman was wrong. It, it, and then that feeling would come back again. Um, so that's, it's cognitive. So you, okay. So talk therapy doesn't really work. So then the, what they consider the gold standard as treatment is called something called what you just said, ERP, exposure response prevention therapy. So my journey, I found a doctor in Hollywood. Now, most people don't know that because unfortunately in psychology, the APA will allow anyone to see anyone anywhere as long as they're licensed. So you could see someone who doesn't even know how to spell OCD (laughs) and they could technically, (laughs) they could technically treat it. Right. Um, Unfortunately, and, and there are people pushing to have that changed. I think it's a huge disservice. I think OCD people need to be with someone who is certified and specialized in OCD and ERP, um, which I am. So I did ERP myself as a patient. Now, I finally was in the right spot. I found one of the best. He's now since passed away, Dr. Bruce Hyman. He was amazing. So amazing. He, he's not listening. No, sadly. Yeah, but he was so, he was the best. He really helped me. Um, I So here's the problem. He would do an exposure. He Now, I didn't enjoy therapy anymore. I wasn't in love anymore because <laughs> 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 it was real therapy. He would take me to places that triggered me, like that's the exposure, like let's say Publix, okay? He'd have me do something I was avoiding, which avoidance is a compulsion. Like he would have me touch raw meat, right? And then like maybe touch my face. Ew. And (laughs) I know, but if you, I know it sounds gross, but if you think about it, it's something non-OCD people do all the time. If you're at Publix and you grab all your groceries and you check out, you may scratch your face and not even know you did it or touch your hair. Right, right. But I... It's possible. I mean, it's gross touching raw meat and putting touching my face, but I never would think I would get HIV from it. Right, right. But not, not raw meat, like the actual raw meat. He meant like pick up, you know how when it's already in its plastic container oh, and you see. pick it up to buy. I see, okay. <laughs> no, not real. No, no, not real. Right? No. I'd be scared like, <laughs> of other things, but not HIV. But... <laughs> right. No, like how you would go shopping and right. it's already contained. And you pick okay. it up. Gotcha. So, or he would have me use the cashier. I would avoid a cashier if she had a band aid or a bandage or a scar or something red. Um, he would have me like go to that thing. So, what happened is he was doing it correctly. But I was doing sneaky compulsions. I was doing compulsions anyway that he couldn't see. Like I would make sure not to, I don't know, touch something. Like I would touch the the meat, but not with my pinky, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. So in my head, I was like, when it comes time to touch my face, I'm only going to use the pinky. Mm-hmm. So basically I was making myself <laughs> worse and I paid $7,000. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah. And it was a lot in those days because you're going back 12 years. God. So. That's three tanks of gas. That, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. So, <laughs> so that's where. So then what happened was I got myself better using my own. Like I, first of all, 
in ERP, there's no real focus on motivation or building courage or getting the urge, the sense of urgency going. Um, my program there is, we have a whole phase where we help you like build up that courage in ERP. You just kind of even trained ERP. Um, you just, you just jump into it. You make like what's called a hierarchy and you have someone slowly face their fears or build up to it that way. Hmm. Um, so I had something happen to me that kind of made me feel like rock bottom. Like, you know, like I had a moment where I, where I really saw that and understood that most likely I was never going to catch a, I mean, I don't really do anything that would really warrant that, but like most likely I wasn't going to catch AIDS, but a hundred percent for sure. OCD was going to destroy everything. My life, my child's life. It was never really going to be AIDS. It was going to be my OCD. Mm -hmm. And I finally, because I hit like a, I had a horrible thing happen. I hit rock bottom and it finally like gave me that moment where I saw that with clarity. So the next, the next five days, I was easily able to resist all compulsions because, because I was scared that the OCD, I finally got it. I was finally scared that the OCD was going to ruin my life, you know? Yeah. So I gave up the compulsions and then on day six, they started coming back like a lot of the thoughts and I wanted to do a lot of the stuff I was doing, the compulsions. That's when I created all these kind of games. I would start playing with myself to resist doing the compulsions. I created all these like these games and these strategies for myself. And then I would like practice them and play them all day long. And it helped me stay away from the compulsions until it became like a solid habit. And what I noticed was I started thinking about HIV less and less and less to the point where I just, I would go a day without thinking about it, two days without thinking about it, three days. Right. And now, unless, unless I have to tell my story, like I'm doing right now, I don't think about it anymore. Right. Huh. So are you the only therapist that, um, has this uh, type of therapy or has it, has it, is it catching on with other, other counselors and therapists and stuff? Yes, actually, I was the only therapist, but mm. now I have since trained, we have trained, I have now trained therapists for the state of Florida, the state of Rhode Island, the state of Massachusetts, and we just got the state of Connecticut going. So, so East and Coast I am therapy. Hoping, East Coast therapy, yeah. <laughs> and I am I am hoping I also have a video online course that is coming out. I'm in the process of recording it for people international if they want this kind of therapy. And I am also um, looking to train if anyone is listening to Todd in addition to Katie. And <laughs> I am looking to train other therapists in other states that we don't have so far um, as part of the, to get training for for Rip Bar. I am hoping. I'm still an ERP advocate. I'm trained in it. And Rip R is based in ERP. I just felt I found a way to, to I don't know how else to say this, to in a non-arrogant way. I think I found a way to make it better. Right. Right. So. And I mean, everybody learns differently. Everybody heals differently. So, I mean, some people might heal and, and learn from the exposure response, but Lots of people do. I actually did just straight ERP for a lot of years as a clinician. I helped a lot of people with it. Yes, ERP can create miracles. I'm an advocate of it. Um, I will never speak badly about ERP because I don't look at my therapy as a competition with ERP. I look at my therapy as if ERP doesn't really work for you, here's a reconfiguration of it right. so for you. It's just another tool. Correct. Like, right. like act, like you were saying, acceptance, commit and therapy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So for people to take the training for rip R therapy, which is what you were talking about, this is your therapy. Um, you have to be a, uh, you already have to be a counselor or a therapist to take it. You can't just someone off the street, learn your, you take your training or can they? Well, well, they can now not to work for my program because there's laws and rules, you know, and like all that. Okay. that I don't, Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's like they're not going to let you can't open shop. Right. Exactly. But 
Um, yeah, like you can't just like graduate high school and be like, hey, I'd like to <laughs> learn rip art. Um, but if somebody off the street wants to just learn my therapy for whatever reason they want, legally, they're not going to be allowed to treat anyone because that's part of the state law. But they can take my video online course, like if they want to, you know, like, like, let's say, for example, you wanted to just want take my online course just to find out more about your son or if you wanted to teach your son some stuff you could do that hmm. but um so i can practice on family members i just can't open up to the public <laughs> yes that's, <laughs> yes but <laughs> i'm actually in canada anyway so i don't know what the laws are here oh okay but yeah that's anyone could watch my online course if they want that but to be like part of the program that i have and you know and yeah you have to be licensed mental health counselor or is something licensed and um i the only people i have trained so far are licensed counselors but they already have a background with working with ocd or addiction i've i've purposefully selected people hmm. uh because it's it's a three-hour training i'm like i assume when they do the training that they already no ERP even. Right, right, yeah. So they have a nice foundation and base or hate to work from. It's not a three hour course and uh, right. I'm gonna open an office now. <laughs> correct, correct. So so a couple of the clinicians we have, to, I think two of the clinicians that are trained in the state of Florida um, have already worked at even Rogers Behavioral Health, which is for OCD, so. And they're finding success with it? Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, we find a lot of success with it. I guess you, you have to tell me that, but <laughs> you wouldn't be draining people if it didn't work, I guess. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. I just enjoy wasting time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, know I think it works. Thought. It worked for me, so <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> I like, well, rip art, rip art is exactly what it, it's cognitive. It's very cognitive behavioral. Um, it, we have, we have cognitive exercises, we have behavioral strategies and we have, it's more behavioral than anything because look, the name of the game, no matter what therapy a person does, that's why you don't want talk therapy because the name of the game is compulsion control, compulsion resistance It is no different than if you have an addiction problem. The first thing they want to do is obviously like get the substance away like you have to control your usage that's if you have a binge eating problem yeah you have to control the food you have to so these compulsive behaviors have to be controlled so um uh, the problem is is that there is a cognitive element because you have all these uh, you know these thoughts in your head that are like either scaring you or telling you stuff so you do have to control the thoughts and then you have to control that horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. You have to get both in control. Sounds like hell. It really does. <laughs> I mean, I've, I, I, I've told this story before on here, but I have a friend that I work for part time and seasonally and stuff. And she's a, a social worker and she's really been hounding me to, to try cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's just, it sounds like hell. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I actually saw a therapist that was trying to do that too and it's just I didn't do any of the homework and I was just like I don't know I, maybe I'm just stubborn <laughs> I don't know it's a look it's I have a 15 year old client he's hilarious and he said to me we were talking about actually he does his mom put him in because he's he's using all kinds of like substances and everything so I was talking to him about like, you know, fighting the thoughts and like dealing with the feeling without using the substance. And he said to me, he's just funny. He goes, he goes, I'm telling you, doc, life is boring when I don't use it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's true. It's, like, it's just boring. <laughs> Boredom was a huge trigger for my addiction. I'm not going to lie, but, uh, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard. I'm, I've actually like, because I, I do have bad anxiety still, I'm almost scared to fix myself. It's like, I'm so sick of living this way, but I'm scared to do the work to do. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. It's like this. Yeah. It's, it's circle. very, but think of it this way. It, 
everybody I see is terrified to face whatever. I didn't want to face my stuff either, but it is now that I'm on like the other side of it. Um, and I've been in recovery a really long time and I even have two more children, you know, since then, um, um, I find it very liberating and I'm, uh, there was a time I didn't even want to tell people or especially my clients that I had OCD. Now I'll tell anyone anywhere because I've changed it into, it is what it is. I have it. I didn't ask for it, but I have it. I controlled it. And pro- it's definitely the thing I'm the most proud of, of myself in my life because, because of fighting that horrific feeling and fighting all the thoughts on a daily basis. So yeah, I'm proud of myself. And now I feel like very, like, even when I was facing it, even when I was beginning and getting into recovery, it was always terrifying. There's always that little part of me that was so proud of myself. Like I kind of felt like, wow, like <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm stronger than I thought. <laughs> oh yeah. I know when I was in the middle of a uh, 28 day treatment. Yeah. It was the scariest thing ever. And then, and then, yeah, now I'm really proud of myself. So it's like, I'm constantly working on myself doing it. It's like, okay, I've already treated myself with addiction. I've, you know, I've, I've gone to therapy years. I've done all types of work. Why do I have to keep like, I'm just exhausted sometimes. Like I have, I'd have to do more work. Like, (laughs) God, (laughs) what am I just going to be cured? (laughs) It is hard to go through life as a compulsive person because Mm -hmm. you do have to, you do always, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You do always have to try to keep all those little, you know, whack-a-mole where you have to keep yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> hit those heads. You yeah. gotta like one pops up. <laughs> um, yeah, you do kind of have to, but I feel I feel people that you know have been sober, um, went and have been sober for a while mm-hmm. are like the strongest people on the planet. Oh yeah, I'm super strong. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> and humble. You are, you are. And humble. I'm this, no one's more humble than me. You know. Humble and strong. <laughs> <laughs> so is OCD like an addiction where you like, you, you'll have it forever? Like you, you just have to maintain it or, or is it like yeah, so you don't get cured ever? I'm going to give you my opinion because I guess there would be, you could call this a little bit of controversy because I have run into people that have claimed you can cure it. Mm. I would say absolutely not. And I would say, it's in my, this is my opinion, opinion, disclaimer. <laughs> um, but I have a doctorate, so I guess I'm entitled to an opinion. <laughs> um, I believe that OCD is not curable. It is a psychiatric condition that affects 2% of the population. And you do have to achieve a recovery, a state of recovery. And I don't think it is wise actually to ever use the word cure because one should never turn their back on the idea that it could it could pop back up on you in a like overnight and i feel the same way about addiction i feel you always keep your eye on it you always are aware of it and you always have to control it mhm so you hear that Joaquin phoenix and katie perry <laughs> and that doctor don't turn your dr. back dr freeman freeman <laughs> <there you go. laughs> we're assuming in case, um, it's funny, I just did an Instagram reel where I named four celebrities that I knew uh, came out with OCD. They were, and I said her name wrong in the reel. I feel bad. Amanda Seyfried, Seyfried, Seyfried. Okay. Don't know. <laughs> Do you know who she is? No idea. I actually love her from Mean Girls. She played Karen. Okay. I don't, I don't no. know. <laughs> she was in Mama Mia. Oh, Mamma Mia. Oh, of course I know that. <laughs> um, okay, Justin Timberlake. You know him, right? He's Canadian. He's Canadian. There you go. He's got it. Um, who else? David Beckham. English. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bend it like and, Beckham. Uh, Bend it like Beckham. And Camila Cabello. 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 I can't say the name. I'm not sure who that is either. You know, like, Senorita Sean Mendes, Canadian. Sean Mendes' girlfriend? Oh. Ex-girlfriend. Okay. I think they broke up. If if you're a celebrity younger than 40, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> you're funny. I'm like, how do the question is, the question is, how do I know them, Todd? Because <laughs> they have OCD. 
<laughs> Correct. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not done with the the new stuff. I don't know. Just down with the kids. <laughs> yeah. Down with the. I know Tom Hanks and anyone his generation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know old people with OCD. No, I'm kidding. I don't <laughs> They've been cured. <laughs> oh, that is funny. I'm trying to think if I know somebody older with OCD. Well, Leonardo DiCaprio says he has it. A lot of you people know. say they have it. It's like I well, tell people raise... I have ADHD, but I've never been diagnosed. I just assume. <laughs> I mean, it is it is true. Well, I will tell you this. Leo. Um, if you're listening, Leo. In... Leo, just listen. I call so. Call me Leo. Um, <laughs> yes, Leo was in the movie The Aviator. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal movie, and it de- it depicts. It's a very accurate depiction of um, OCD. Have you seen that, Todd? I actually haven't seen it, but I know the story of the of the guy uh, Howard Hughes and stuff. Howard but, Hughes. Yeah. You need to watch that. You really should watch that movie. I, I do have a bit of a man crush on him, so I should. He's, I mean, who does not have <laughs> like a Leo crush? Who doesn't have a Leo crush? <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Alyssa. Al- Alyssa? Alyssa Kaufman, psychologist extraordinaire. I have to say, I learned a ton about OCD. And I mean, we, that was just the tip of the iceberg. So if you would like to follow her on Instagram... Her handle is OCD underscore help underscore now. She posts quite a bit of stuff and little videos and reels and stories and you can contact her. And uh, because of this day and age, if you need therapy, she can do it online. So that's, that's one of the bonuses of a pandemic is having the ability to now Zoom anything you want, including therapy sessions. That might be the only bonus, maybe. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I hope you like playing my little game. Oh, did you catch my my false fact? If not, here it is. I confused Justin Timberlake with Justin Bieber, and I said he was Canadian. And in fact, he's not Canadian at all. Justin Timberlake is as American as apple pie. So there you go. I, I caught that while I was editing. I thought, what, what in the hell am I talking about? That's not right at all. So anyway... There's that. And uh, next week, don't forget Joel Seal talking about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And uh, the weeks to come, man, I'm telling you, there are amazing guests. I have uh, a, a Canadian soldier fought in Afghanistan. He's been in the military for 28 years. He's written a new book and he talks to me about PTSD and the different therapies he's, he's trying. Uh, I am talking to a young guy who lost four of his family members in a drinking and driving accident. And not only am I speaking with him, but the the drunk driver's son. And, uh, you know, it's all about forgiveness. And it, it's the two of them are amazing. It, it's that's it's going to be an amazing episode. Uh, and there's there's more. I'm talking to the the daughter of the real Dirty John, that TV show. Uh, her name's Tara Newell. I'm speaking with comedian Jeremy Hotz. Yeah, there's, I've got so many wonderful guests. It's going to be a great summer of, of podcasting episodes. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm very excited. Okay, so now I can say come back next week, not two weeks from now. So come back next week. And hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll have some YouTube videos up where you can watch uh, you can watch my face talk to someone else's face and watch their face talk back to my face. So that that could be something. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And please subscribe, rate, and review however you are listening to this podcast. It only takes a moment, and it really helps the show out with getting noticed. This episode has been sponsored by Penny University Bookstore. 3104 13th Avenue. Call 639-571-2186 and check out their online bookstore at pennyu.ca. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is supported by Conexus. Wellness, however you define it, is achievable. You don't even need to figure it all out by yourself. Talk to Conexus. 
They'll give you guidance, motivation, and the push you need to reach your goals. They've got you. They're your financial partner and they know you can achieve your very best, your financial best. Prove them right. Start right at Connexus Credit Union. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is also sponsored by Direct West. Are you a business owner looking for new avenues to promote your business? Direct West digital billboards are a great opportunity to highlight a new product, new promotion, or anything else you'd like your customers to know about. You can get local, expert marketing help for your business at directwest.com. If you are having a mental health crisis, please call the Canadian Crisis Number at 1-833-456-4566. In Saskatchewan, the mobile crisis team in Prince Albert is 306 Seven six four one zero one one. In Regina, it's three zero six five two five five three three three, and in Saskatoon, it's three zero six nine three three six two zero zero. Don't forget to check out my children's book. Sometimes Daddy cries. Sometimes Daddy cries is told through the eyes of a boy whose father suffers from depression. He sees his dad get sad, rest and even go to the hospital, all while comparing his father's depression to a physical ailment. Available on Amazon.ca. I'll see you next time. This is Todd Redebaum saying, make your beds and take your meds. Bye!